please, I've just, I've just come back to my flat and the door was locked, so I crawled through the window and my flatmate's covered in blood in the bathroom. Is she breathing? I don't know, I can't, I can't look, I'm sorry. Okay, I can't try, look. try and stay calm. Alice! 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 Oh my God, she's dead, she's dead. Christmas Eve, 1991. Sue and Clive welcome their daughter Alice into the world. Described by friends and family as a loving and empathetic person, outgoing, quick-witted and fun 24-year-old Alice Ruggles was adored by those in her life. People that knew her said she had the ability to cheer anyone up and was a natural entertainer. She was mischievous, funny and loved socialising. Alice was from a close-knit family and was the third of four children. She and her siblings grew up in the quiet, rural Leicestershire village of Turlangton. She attended Leicester High School for Girls and from there went on to Northumbria University to study product design. Alice discovered fencing at the age of 11 and the sport quickly became a big part of her life. She went on to represent her home county of Leicestershire and the East Midlands region numerous times. At Northumbria University, Alice became the fencing club captain and went on to win the women's epee at the Leeds Open in 2012. Alice fell in love with the city of Newcastle and carried on living there after she graduated. She got a job at Sky's Newscastle hub and it wasn't long before her hard-working attitude paid off and she was promoted to site coordinator. In October 2015, Alice started talking to Tremaan Dillon. Tremaan, known to everyone as Harry, was a lance corporal based at Glencourse Barracks in Edinburgh, Scotland, and was training to join the Special Reconnaissance Regiment. At the time he and Alice connected, he was serving in Afghanistan, and the pair started talking over Facebook. In January 2016, the couple met in person for the first time, and initially, the relationship appeared to be going well. 26-year-old Dylan was caring, attentive and considerate, and friends said Alice seemed besotted. He and Alice spent a couple of weeks together in Newcastle and then in Edinburgh before he returned to Afghanistan for his final two-month tour of duty. Dylan returned to the UK in April and in July, Alice invited him on the family's annual holiday where the pair were inseparable. However, this would not last and it wasn't long before the cracks began appearing in the couple's short relationship. People in Alice's life started to notice some concerning changes in her Once outgoing and someone that loved any chance to socialise, Alice was becoming distant and withdrawn. Dylan was becoming more and more critical of her in every way, so much so that it drove Alice further into an isolated state. She began losing a lot of weight and started falling out with friends she was once so close to. After a fight with her housemates, she moved out and into the ground floor flat on Rawling Road in Gateshead, where she lived with one of her work friends, Maxine women started contacting Alice, saying they had also been seeing Dylan at the same time she was. Following these claims, she ended the relationship for good in August. But Dylan was not prepared to accept no for an answer, and Alice's mental and physical health began to deteriorate even more over the following months. He bombarded her with calls, texts and emails. While some messages were apologetic and begging for her to give him another chance, Alice, please. Please, please, please. I can't do it. Please. Alice, please call me back. Please. I just want to speak to you. There's nothing else. I don't even know if you're getting this voice message, but please, can you call me back? Thank you. Others were threatening and aggressive. He started contacting her family and friends even texting Sue, referring to her as mom, and begging her to convince Alice to take him back. He then went on to tell her what a horrible person her daughter was. He was completely obsessed and would stop at nothing to get Alice's attention. Alice initially tried to be sympathetic and kind, feeling bad that he was so affected by the end of the relationship. 
but she soon was left with no choice but to cut him off as the tirade of messages and calls proved too much. He hacked into her social media accounts and threatened to release photos he had secretly taken of her. At the beginning of September, he gained access to Alice's Facebook account and found out that she had started a new relationship with an army officer called Mike. Dylan was completely enraged and contacted Mike, lying and telling him that Alice was still seeing him at the same time. On September 30th, Dylan drove to Alice's flat, repeatedly ringing the doorbell and then hiding when she looked outside. She knew in her gut it was him and didn't open the door. A few hours later, Dylan climbed the fence into the back garden and knocked on Alice's window as she was in her bedroom. When she opened the curtains, she saw flowers and chocolates on the windowsill and Dylan slowly backing away with his arms in the air. As he drove back to Edinburgh, he left a sinister voicemail on her phone that said in part, I just wanted to give you flowers and chocolates to prove that no, I don't want to kill you. I'm not intending to kill you. That's all I wanted to say. After we spoke and you didn't want to speak, well, you didn't want to call me again. So I, that's why I decided to come down to give you flowers and chocolates. Um, on my way back. If you want to take it, you can take it. If you want to bin it, you can bin it. It's completely up to you. I just wanted to do something just to say I'm sorry and, and show that I am really am sorry. And yeah, that's the least I could have done. But I know you're not going to come out in front of me and speak to me, so that's why I left it there. If you want to speak to me, it'll be good. If you don't, there's nothing I can do. Anyways, sorry for waking you up. Hope you have a good night's sleep. Bye. Desperate for help and with the situation getting worse, Alice contacted the non-emergency police number 101 for advice. Hi there, um, I just need a bit of advice really, um, more than anything. Um, so I split up with my boyfriend about three months ago. Um, since then, I, I know that he's hacked into my Facebook and also my phone. Um, he's been sending me a lot of messages even though I've asked him not to contact me. And um, basic, basically like just messaging my friends and things um, and then tonight he's um, well I had a knock at my door and well he'd, he'd sent me a message saying I've been in the garden since five I had a knock at my door um, and then when I went and looked, I've got like a little you know the thing that you can look through um, and there was no one there and then it happened again um, two or three times and then um, he's come round the back, knocked on my bedroom window at the back of my flat, it's the ground floor flat. Um, and he's been outside and he, he's like left um, some flowers and chocolates on the like outside window. So I'm like, he walked off, he's not done anything, but I'm just, I'm concerned. I've been putting off, like my friends have been telling me to call the police. I've been right. putting it off, but it, I just feel a bit like shaken up tonight. So. Right. Well, it's, it's, it can be past as harassment, yeah. which is a crime. Yeah. If you know any contact from them, there's a number of things you can do. Yeah. You could go to a solicitor and take out an injunction. Yeah. Keep them away from you. Yeah. Or report it directly at least now, and we can issue them with a pin notice, which means if he ever comes near you again or contacts you again, he'll be arrested. Okay. So which would you prefer? Can I... Um Try that option, please. Yeah, of course you can. I'll bet your name, please. Oh, sorry, um, it's Alice. So what's he called? Well, his name's Harry Dillon, um, but he's, he's got like a, a seat name, which is Truman. Um, he lives in Edinburgh. In, um, ah, he lives in Edinburgh. Yeah. So he's like driven down. So he's constantly contacting you by, by, by phone or text or... Yeah, um, well, I've blocked his number. He's got two phones. I've blocked both numbers. Um, so he's been sending me Gmail messages. I haven't blocked him off Gmail because I don't want him to start emailing my work email. Then he's also made a fake Snapchat account to try and contact me on. Okay, we'll need to get the end of the police to go and serve him with a pit and orders. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to see if I'm making an appointment to come and see you. Yeah. Yeah. In the morning. Yeah. We'll get the details. 
Thank you. Okay. And we'll oh. sort it out. We'll get it sorted for you. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, Alice. Thank okay. you. Then. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. bye. They logged the incident as harassment and issued a police information notice, also known as a PIN. A PIN is issued as a caution where there are allegations of harassment made, but it is not a court order, nor does it give you a criminal record, and signing it does not admit to any wrongdoing on the perpetrator's part. On October 3rd, this warning was communicated to Dylan in his barracks. It was arranged for his major at the Edinburgh barracks to issue the police information notice, although national guidance stated this should be done by a police officer in person unless exceptional circumstances prevented them. Despite the pin being issued, he sent Alice a parcel containing a letter and some other items. In the letter, he told her he knew she'd called the police, and he was now in a lot of trouble for it. He told her they had taken his laptop and phone away from him, but this was another lie. In the letter, he also said, I'm in a lot of shit now but hope you feel happy now. I'm sending you everything I have that reminds me of you, as you belong to another man. Wishing you two a happy life. I will never come in your life again. Alice contacted the police for a second time. Sorry, good evening, Northumbria. Peace, Jeff speaking, how can I help? Hi there. Um, Yeah, I've been in touch with the police. Um, I'm... uh, the, the, somebody's been issued with a pen so that they, they can't contact me. However, I've had a I've had a letter off them. So you're, you're reporting like the breach, of, the breach of the pen? Yeah, yeah. And who was it from? Um, Harry Dillon. Uh, what was the content of the letter? Was he... So pictures of me and him, um, like, because uh, he's my ex-boyfriend too, like a, a notebook that I sent him when we were together and a letter. Okay, uh, and uh, so what was the... Con- what was the nature of it? Was it like threatening or was it harassing? Or... No, um, not threatening. It just it's just saying um, that he, he knows I called the police on him and he's had everything confiscated and all he has to himself is a pen and paper and an iPod and explaining why he came down last Friday. Um, and then um, it says at the bottom he won't contact, you know, this will be the last I hear from him, but he's, he's said that a lot of times and it's... He, he never does seem to stop. So, so do you want to call back to discuss this? Yeah. What? What? What's usually what happens with it? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll let I'll, I'll uh, let them know you want to. So I want to contact you back just to uh, discuss what can be done. Okay. Will it be the, the police officer that's been dealing with my case? Uh, I can't guarantee who it'll be. Um, I let well. I mean, I let them know you've got you've got your pen notice there, so it's it's going in a breach of it. Um, okay. Is the best time to phone you back? Um, any any time really will be fine. Okay, nice. I'll let them know so you want someone to contact you. Yeah, please. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, bye. Thanks, bye. She told people she felt palmed off at the response from the police and was distraught and defeated feeling nothing could or would be done to stop Dylan. She chillingly said to her sister Emma, she felt the police would only respond when he stabs me. The 24-year-old was living in a state of fear, constantly looking over her shoulder. She asked to be driven home to her front door each day by a colleague, and once inside, she would immediately double lock it. During the evening of October 10th, Dylan drove down to her flat again, He climbed into the back garden and took a photo of the back window and bathroom before driving back to Edinburgh. Alice's day at work finished as normal. Supervisor Paul gave her a lift home, dropping her straight at her door at 5.30pm. She messaged some friends, showing them an outfit she had bought, and briefly chatted to her boyfriend Mike. The messages then abruptly stopped. 
Alice's flatmate Maxine returned home just before 6.30. Please, I've just, I've just come back to my flat and the door was locked, so I crawled through the window and my flatmate's covered in blood in the bathroom. Is she breathing? I don't know, I can't, I can't look, I'm sorry. Okay, can't try, look. try and stay calm. Alice! 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 Oh my God, she's dead, she's dead. And yet the door was open. No, it wasn't open, it was locked and I crawled through my window that was open in the back door and she's lying covered in blood, she's, she's blue. Can you have a look and see if she's breathing for the ambulance? She's not, she's not. She's not breathing? No, she looks, no. Where's the blood from? It's everywhere, I don't know, her leg looks broken, everything. Say that again, sorry. Her leg looks broken, everything, I don't know. Alice! Alice, how much blood is there? There's lots, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. She was, it looks like she was in the shower, she's... Everything to not go. It looks like she's been attacked. Please help. Uh, things have been tipped over in the bathroom. Yes, and everything so looks a mess. Like she's not breathing. She's actually blue. Please. I mean, you. This is coming. I, I, I act as an absolute psychopath. Say that again. Sorry. Uh, she's put on a complaint on about her ex, and she wrote 101 at the weekend to report that she started in contact, and she says we're going to do nothing now. This has happened. Right. Who who tried to contact her at the weekend? No, she's contacted 101 because she put in a statement about him two weeks ago. And about who? Her ex-boyfriend, Harry Dillon. Right, so have they, she been having problems with her ex? Yes. So do you think this, that's what it is? Yeah, I can hear the police are coming. <laughs> yeah, they've seen the oh. scene. I'll wait with you until they're actually with you. Okay, okay you're yeah. doing really well. You're doing really well, Maxine. Alice Ruggles was pronounced dead at 7.30pm. Her throat had been slit at least six times and she had suffered 24 injuries in total. The coroner concluded that Alice had died from catastrophic blood loss. The police quickly identified Dylan as their only suspect. Officers started running his car number plate through the automated number plate recognition system. They quickly got a hit when his car was clearly picked up travelling from Edinburgh down to Newcastle earlier that day. Just before midnight, Dylan was arrested in his barracks on suspicion of murder. At 3.24am, Dylan arrived at Gateshead Police Station for questioning. During an interview, he admitted he had travelled to Newcastle that day, but said it was because he wanted answers and closure about why the relationship had ended. He denied entering her flat, claiming that Alice was the one that came out and approached him. He told officers that she said she had heard stories about men killing their girlfriends and she was scared he would do the same to her. Dylan said he reached out to hold her hands and she scratched him across the face. After this, he drove away, he said. But what had actually happened was Dylan drove down and parked near Alice's flat, waiting for her to return from work. While waiting, he started messaging a girl on Tinder, making plans to meet up later that night. Around 6pm, he climbed over the back wall and forced his way in through the window. He grabbed a knife from the kitchen and cornered Alice as she went into the bathroom. He knelt on her back to pin her down and slit her throat, cutting through to her spine. While Dylan was in custody, police discovered Alice's blood on his steering wheel and on his Help for Heroes wristband. Analysis of her phone records placed the phone en route to Edinburgh too. A few hours later... Dylan was charged with the murder of Alice Ruggles. His trial began in April 2017 at Newcastle Crown Court, and he was still pleading not guilty to murder, but the overwhelming amount of evidence meant he and his defence team had no choice but to change his story. Dylan claimed that he showed up at Alice's flat with the intention of getting his belongings when a violent argument ensued. 
Alice attacked him with a knife, and in the process of trying to hurt him, she had inflicted the injuries upon herself. He then said that as Alice lay dying, she spoke of how much she hated her family. Dylan was asked what was going through his head as he looked down at Alice, and his response was that he felt terrible for her father Clive, as he had been unable to protect his daughter in her last moments. The court also heard that a restraining order had been taken out against Dylan by an ex-girlfriend three years earlier. After his ex had broken up with him, he tracked her down and spat in her face in the streets while hurling abuse at her and her new boyfriend. Sadly, at the time of Alice's phone calls, Northumbria police had no knowledge about the earlier restraining order. After an 11-day trial and just two hours of deliberations, Dylan was found guilty of the murder of Alice Ruggles and sentenced to life imprisonment, with a minimum term of 22 years. Carrying the knife to the flat would have given a 25-year starting point for Dylan to serve in prison, but as he didn't arrive armed with the weapon, and to pick it up while he was in the flat, he was sentenced to a 22-year minimum term instead. During his sentencing, Judge Paul Sloan described the murder as utter barbarism, and said, "'Not a shred of remorse you have shown from first to last.' Indeed, you were only concentrating so hard on getting your story right, when giving evidence you forgot to even shed a crocodile tear. Today, but none of our family, nor any of Alice's closest friends, will ever be the same again. We will live the rest of our lives knowing that Alice should have been here with us, wondering what she would have become imagining all the people she would have continued to affect with her infectious sense of humour and her sheer love of life. Alice was a kind, incredibly sociable, fun-loving person. She had the ability to light up the room whenever she walked in. We miss her so much. We believe there are important lessons to be learned from what happened to Alice. We didn't think that she was the sort of girl something like this would happen too. With hindsight, there are many signs of stalking and coercive behaviour that we did not recognise. Everyone should know about these signs. This is National Stalking Awareness Week and we feel there is a need for much more work to be done to publicise and identify stalking and controlling behaviour, to tackle the root causes and to stop them developing out of control. We all hope to do as much as we can from now on, both on our own and in collaboration with the organisations such as the Susie Lamplew Trust and Women's Aid, to learn lessons, to raise awareness and ultimately, as we all sincerely hope, to help prevent what happened to Alice happening to others. The police's handling of the case received huge backlash. After the trial, Northumbria Police conducted an internal review and identified potential misconduct by officers, which was referred to the Independent Office of Police Conduct. Two officers then faced disciplinary action over the handling of the case. Northumbria Police said they did refer their actions to the Independent Police Complaints Commission, but said no one at the time knew the true threat that Dylan posed. The force have since apologised after the Independent Police Complaints Commission ruled that the officers failed to properly investigate Alice's claims. Gateshead Community Safety Board also carried out a domestic homicide review. The review concluded that Alice had been subject to significant stalking and agreed upon a series of 20 recommendations to help prevent similar incidents from happening again. Her parents, Sue and Clive, said, We believe that her death was preventable. We find it difficult to comprehend that although Alice described in her first phone call to the police that she was being stalked and provided ample evidence, the police and the army were unable to support and protect her. Sue and Clive set up the Alice Ruggles Trust, which raises awareness about stalking and coercive control. They work to ensure that stalking offences result in immediate action, both to protect the victim and to deal effectively with the alleged stalker. The Trust also aims to provide education and training and campaigns for improved legal measures. We really want to raise awareness of, of stalking. So we want to make sure that all the things that happen to Alice don't happen to anybody else. And if anybody else in that situation 
they recognise it for what it is. So they're thinking, hang on, this is this is a warning sign and I need to be careful with you. It's really, really hard coping with the fact that Alice isn't here anymore. We sort of thought originally it would get better, but we realised it's not going to get better. We're just going to get used to living with it. And, uh, you know, we miss her every day, every single day. They also launched the Alice Ruggles Trust Relationship Safety Resource, which is teaching materials and lesson plans that focus on stalking and coercive control. These are freely available to secondary school teachers throughout the UK. In 2020, stalking protection orders were announced by the government. This means that suspected stalkers could be given court orders, blocking them from contacting or approaching their alleged victims, while the police investigate the claims thoroughly. Sue said that new figures show an increase in the number of stalking incidents that were now being recorded by police, and she said this showed that officers were now correctly identifying the crime. Alice Ruggles' spirited, fun and affectionate personality continues to live on through those that knew her. She made a huge impact in a short space of time. Her family and friends vow to keep her memory alive and hope that her story will continue to help and educate by supporting those that may have experienced similar things and by challenging the law and the handling of similar cases. Most importantly, they vow that Alice's name will not be forgotten and her voice will continue to be heard. If you have been affected by any of the issues raised in today's episode surrounding issues of coercive control, domestic abuse and stalking, I've left links to further resources in the description box below.